Hi, and welcome to Tony Time. Well, I want you all to go get your coffee if you're watching my show during the morning or cocktail at night, whatever it may be. And um, I have a special guest on my show today, a dear, dear friend of over 35 years, little over 40 years. Um, we've been through a lot together. We met years ago in Chicago. Um, he surprised me here uh, last Wednesday. Um, I thought he was in L.A., and here Ed was in Maine. Um, so we've had a wonderful week together, but there's some special things about Ed that I would like to talk about because I know all of you out there in the viewing audience either are caregiver, um, taking care of your parents, whatever it may be. Um, so we're going to talk about that a little bit and know that you're not alone out there. Ed, welcome to our show. Hi. Hi. Welcome in. <laughs> At least this time you know I'm here. <laughs> yes, I do know you're here. Uh, that was a great surprise you gave me. I mean, he literally walked. I was out having dinner with some friends. Ed calls me from L.A. I thought it was from L.A. Well, the phone number was from L.A. And, um, you know, I said, well, I'm out having dinner with friends. We're on dessert. He said, okay, well, call me later. Hung up, didn't think anything out of the phone call that, you know, he's in L.A. So I get home, and I'm dropping off all the ladies to their specific houses. The last lady lives across the street from me. And I see this man in a hooded sweatshirt, red. And, you know, we don't see that in Maine on a dark street in a deserted area. And I'm watching this man in the hooded sweatshirt coming closer to my car. Then he comes around the back of the car. And he, he says, I says, how can I help you? He said, I need directions. I said, directions where or something? And he said, to your house. I said, no. He said, no, I'm going home with you. No, you're not. And then he pulled the hood off, and it was Ed. So what a thought-out, wonderful surprise. But I would recommend not doing that ever again because it was pitch black out. Yeah, it was. Yeah, so. and, and if I would have had pepper spray, who knows what would have happened. <laughs> I know what would have happened. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So in the meantime, why... I wanted Ed on the show and to talk about caregiving. Ed, for what, 10 years, you were going back and forth from LA to Chicago, like every two weeks? Closer to about 14. Okay, 14 years. Every two weeks, getting on a plane, fl flying back to Chicago, making sure his father was okay. I mean, before that, it was his mom and then his sister, who have all passed. Um, Ed has been there. Ed has been the caregiver to his sister, who at a young age had Alzheimer's, right? Mm -hmm. When was she diagnosed? Uh, she was 50. It's young. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fortunately, uh, there are many people that, that suffer Alzheimer's for many, many years. And with her, it was roughly seven, eight years max. So uh, it moved quickly? Y yeah, yeah. 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 So, I mean, you know, and it was only the two of you. I mean, there are no other children or siblings. Right. Mm -hmm. His mom um, was before Sharon. Mm -hmm. What did your mom have? Besides old age. <laughs> yeah, besides old age. Uh, mom wound up having uh, heart surgery and just had a really difficult time coming out of the heart surgery. So just didn't quite make it. Okay. She had a quadruple bypass, and uh, they thought that she would survive it, uh, but when they got in there, they realized that there was too much damage to the heart muscle. Um, so. Okay. So then it came down to his father, who was in the Navy, mm -hmm. uh, Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. involved in Pearl Harbor. He lived his life kind of reminiscing or that's the wrong word I'm using. I think he spent the, uh, the last 30 years of his life more or less living within his memories of the Navy. Yeah. They were very real to him, very real. You know, he did go through a tremendous amount of, of agony 
Uh, he made it through Pearl Harbor with no difficulty. Mm -hmm. he, he was not injured there, uh, but his ship was sunk in the Philippines. And he and the surviving crew were in the water for like two and a half days. Wow. Yeah, the Navy kind of <clears throat> forgot about him. So, ah. so they finally sent his ship out. And, uh, but he had uh, lost one shoulder, half of the other shoulder, shrapnel, everything. But he survived. He survived, but as, but as his life went on, he was more, he was in pain continuously. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, you're talking 14 years of caregiving from afar. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it's very expensive, and we all know that. And Ed couldn't be there um, every day 24-7. So you did hire some caregivers mm -hmm. that came in. But of course, they had to be a specific type of personality. His father was tough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, he was very vocal. Yeah. You know, if he didn't like something, it was a... The, well, <coughs> the hardest one was the first, because that was uh, my mom and dad both came out of a nursing home on the same day, uh, rehab nursing. And they had never had anyone in that house to help before that. Yeah. And they come home after being in rehab and here is this stranger who is there to care for them. And that was very, very difficult for them. Very difficult. How did the caregiver, I mean, did she kind of fall into place after a while? Did she get the personalities? The first one was there for roughly a week. Oh my. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it was a male. Okay. And dad could not tolerate another male mm. in the house. So, it, you know, it was a very, very new experience for them. Dad, of course, was still the head of household, and having another man there was very difficult. Uh, after that, wound up hiring a um, caregiver that worked out great. Yeah. I was very fortunate. For all the years that I had caregivers, mm -hmm. most of them were absolutely fantastic, just yeah. fantastic. There, there were a couple that were not as fantastic, but it's your responsibility to keep an eye on things and uh, make sure everything is being done right. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. And of course, after um, your sister passed away, and then it was just really you and your dad. Mm -hmm. And because he was a proud man, because as, as Ed said, um, to have another man in the house taking care of you after being in the military, that's very difficult. That is just hard on the ego. But as your father went on, and I mean, it took 14 years until he literally kind of slowly digressed. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, every military function in Chicago he was one of how many that was still alive? Well, <clears throat> he passed recently, and he, I think he was uh, one of three surviving uh, Pearl Harbor survivors within the Chicagoland area. Mm -hmm. So not, uh, they're, they're going very, very quickly. Well, yeah, and I mean, his father would look forward to going to any event the mayor of Chicago was having for the Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. You know, Every people. December 7th, there were a number of different gatherings, and, and Dad did try to attend as many as possible. Well, you also made sure he got in. I mean, Ed would fly in there for a while, taking his dad to these, because he knew how important it was for his father to be a part of that. Yeah. And, and his father, mm -hmm. um, I mean, he was getting attention, I think it was, for what he did. Yeah. It was something that, <clears throat> until he retired, Dad retired about age 62. He retired a little bit early. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was at that point that he allowed the war to start really coming out. Yeah. It was probably there right along. Yeah. But when he retired, I, I think he had more time to really get into it. And he really did feel that the government really had not acknowledged everyone's service. Um, right. So, yeah, he was, a, he was a big proponent for, uh, you know, 
Never forget, never forget. And he never forgot. Now, you know, I never asked you what your father thought of 9-11. I think like most of us, it, it was nothing that different from everybody's shock. Well, you know, I mean, from his background, military background and his love for all of that. I mean, for that to happen, I just kind of thought maybe he'd have a different kind of... No. No? no he was just as dumbfounded as the rest of us. Okay. Just completely shocked. Wow. I, I happened to be in Chicago on 9-11. Mm-hmm. And we were, you know, at the TV watching what was going on. And it's just amazing. You know, both my mom and dad were just sitting there and just very, very, very silent, you know. Yeah, Didn't very really surreal. Say much. Yeah, very, very surreal. Yeah, yeah, it really was. Um, so now as time went on with Ed, you know, flying back and forth to Chicago every couple of weeks, or I should say twice a month, and sometimes more. Sometimes there would be, he'd, he'd just get back to L.A., and he would get a phone call or something, and he would turn around and go right back. And that's wear and tear. I mean, this is a son who loved his parents, his sister. Um, and he was the only one there to, to make sure everything was going right. Yeah. You know, I mean, your father and you, I mean, you're, you had an up-and-down relationship. But in the end, he, they both loved each other very much. Mm -hmm. But I also think at times within your relationship, there was a little bit on his part that he wished he could be doing this. Could be. Yeah. But uh, Dad was really very used to being cared for. He had so many health issues over the years, and there was always somebody there to take care of him. Um, so never really got the feeling that he wanted to take care of anybody. Oh, well, that's uh, true. But, but that, that was okay. Yeah. That was okay. So tell the audience what it's like when you would leave L.A., what you had to do in L.A. to prepare, mm -hmm. and then when you arrived in Chicago. Mm -hmm. It would depend on, on the time uh, when things started going really bad. The whole thing started in about 2008, mm -hmm. and it picked up speed, and... I'm sorry, yeah, about, I'm sorry, not 2008, in about 2000. Uh, things got a little bit more challenging around 2002. And by 2003, you know what hit the fan. Yeah. Um, uh, that was my last vacation, November of 2003. It was a wonderful vacation. Good. I, I was on the big island of Hawaii and uh, got a phone call from uh, my cousin who was, my, my, my savior yeah. uh, in Chicago, and she proceeded to tell me that my father had fallen down, broken his hip, was in intensive care. And uh, when my cousin arrived at the hospital, and my cousin, who is a semi-retired nurse, she didn't like the way my mom looked, so mom was having a heart attack. So they both wound up being admitted. And while this was happening, uh, my sister was still having to be cared for. At that point, the, the Alzheimer's had not, it had kicked in, but, and she needed care. She needed to have somebody with her. Yeah. So it was, it was very challenging. Fortunately, I had a family that um, responded. Yeah. You know, yeah. My cousin went, help, and uh, they pitched in. Uh, one cousin came to the house to watch over my sister. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it just worked out. Now, now, as time went on and then it was only your father, mm -hmm. um, what was a typical getting ready to go to Chicago? And what was typical getting ready, leaving Chicago to go back to L.A.? I mean, you knew you were, yeah. Uh, while I would be in Los Angeles, fortunately, I could do a lot via the computer. Mm -hmm. So in terms of maintaining the house, taking care of the bills, um, all that kind of stuff, I could do it in L.A., so that, that's all it was. Yeah. Uh, when I would be in Chicago, then you're there physically to fix everything that's breaking um, and just do the, the, the usual house maintenance. 
And, well, I mean, you always try to take your father out to dinner. Mm -hmm. uh, that was our, um, it, if dad was eating, mm -hmm. things were good. Yeah. The man loved to eat, loved yeah. to eat. Yeah. Up until the month before he passed, he could still eat us under the table. Wow. Yeah. Because I know I made a couple trips there mm -hmm. and stayed at the house, and I knew his father. And um, we would go out and eat. You always made sure he went to a restaurant he liked. Mm -hmm. Ed has this uncanny ability and love for knowing what someone likes, what the food they like, picking a restaurant out that, that they enjoy. You know, um, I don't think there's a selfish, selfish bone in you. Don't disagree with me. I've known you for years. I know better. <laughs> Um, but you always made sure he got to do what he enjoyed. Yes. <clears throat> uh, yes, there was love there. Yeah. But for the most part, it was just a matter of trying to think what is going to make his life better yeah. or, or in some way good. So as far as the restaurants were concerned, that was relatively easy yeah. because there were certain restaurants he loved to go to and one of them always fit the bill. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, a lot of what was done, it was just a matter of this is what needs to be done, period. It's very good about that, but, but it's very hard to be a caregiver. Mm, definitely. And, and especially when you're traveling. Or you've got to think of the money. I mean, caregiving, the people you hired as time went on, I mean, they were very dedicated. But when Ed would go in, uh, he would give them three days off or whatever time you were there. Mm -hmm. He would give them time off, and Ed would take care, you know, um, of his father. And, and part of the reason, though, was financial. Because yeah. for those three or four days, I didn't have to pay mm -hmm. him. And... When you're dealing with a budget, yeah. And so, but but it worked out. There were many a time where I'm going, where I would be going. How in the world is this managing to work out? Caregivers are very expensive. Yeah, they are very expensive. Uh, but with retirement from my father and disability and things like that, mm -hmm. managed to work it out. And when I first started doing this, uh, we kind of had an agreement. You know, I promised my, my mom, my sister, and my dad that I would work with them to try to keep them at home as long as possible. Right. And I was very successful with that. My mom passed in the house. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, my sister was at home until about uh, two and a half months before she passed. And then it got to the point where she had to go into assisted living because it was unsafe in the house. The house really wasn't made for that situation. Um, and uh, dad was in the house up until one month before he died. So, so they were able to stay at home as long as possible. My dad, when he would get upset about something, uh, one of the usual things out of my mouth was, so where are you? And he would say, I know, because it was, he was at home he could right. raid the refrigerator when he wanted to. Mm -hmm. He basically still did whatever he wanted. So he was at home. Yeah, yeah. And that's really, really important to the elderly. Yeah, very. And, and especially <laughs> when it's not safe. Now, let me go back to Sharon for a moment. I mean, I had met Sharon as well. And you said, it. you know, the Alzheimer's moved quickly and then it wasn't safe in the house for her. Mm -hmm. What was she doing? Well, when things really started becoming noticeable, mm -hmm. it, it was just the, the, what you would expect with the memory. Um, having difficulty with short-term memory, still very good with long-term memory. Mm -hmm. uh, as things started progressing, um, when things really started turning, I was in the car with my sister and uh, she was driving mm -hmm. and something i mean she was driving do, we were going somewhere where we had gone a million times and she didn't know where she was okay it just hit her so 
I was able to, to get her to pull over to the side of the road, and that was it. That was the last time she was ever behind the wheel. But up to that point, mm -hmm. she was able to manage. But something happened right then, and that was that. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, could, could she get up and make lunch? Could she do any of that as time went on? No. No. Uh, unable to make that kind of decision. So um, there, were, there were very few things that she could do on her own. Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah. She, she, needed, she needed help. It was a, it was a very difficult situation. Uh, like you were saying, when I would come into town, the caregivers would, would you know, have a few yeah. days off. So I would be the primary caregiver for all three. Mm -hmm. uh, after mom passed, then it was my sister and my dad. And at that time, my sister took a lot more work than my dad. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very strange environment because you've grown up with these people. They're your life, your family. And you already have a certain kind of relationship. When things start happening like this, mm -hmm. one of two things. You either continue to be a family member and go totally crazy, mm -hmm. or you learn how to love them and pull back. You've got to pull back. You've got to look at the reality and not the emotions. And that's hard. Yeah. Very hard. Yeah. So. I mean, that definitely is. I mean, <clears throat> you're right. You brought up a point here about you're part of the family, but yet the emotions, seeing the deterioration mm -hmm. of your family, and yet you're the only one there, and you do have to control the emotions. Very much so. And with, with <coughs> mom and dad, there's the role reversal. Yeah. And that's very, very difficult to deal with. Uh, the first time I took care of paying the bills, my father was just livid. Uh, when all of this really started crashing down, mm -hmm. I had come into Chicago, and um, <laughs> I had a family member who had kind of convinced my dad that I was stealing him blind. Oh, jeez. And uh, it was so bad that I had to take my sister and go get a motel. Wow. I, I could not stay in the house. Wow. Uh, fortunately, that only lasted for one trip. But it was just the idea he was not fully under, well, not understanding at all yeah. what I was trying to do. And, and he did not control the last penny. So. Yeah. I mean, when you're dealing with very independent people, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you have to hand over control, yeah. and then a family member comes in and says, you're stealing. I mean, it's very sad. It's okay. I didn't blame him. I blame my family member that started the whole thing. Right. Well, I would too. <laughs> so. I would too. So, I mean, of, of, of course, when you start stepping in and doing that, um, taking over the bills, taking over things, I mean, that's, and then you have your own things back in L.A. Mm -hmm. That's a handful. Yeah, <laughs> and, and there, there's no easy answer, no easy way to deal no. with it. It really is just a matter of having the ability to look at this is what needs to be done. Yeah. And whether I was in Chicago trying to resolve some issue in L.A. or vice versa, mm -hmm. it, it was just a matter of it needs to be done. Now, during all this time, um, Sharon had a cat. Ringo. And so going back, I mean, Ringo's now 15. And, you know, his father, the cat would, you know, go downstairs, see the father, Ed would come in. This cat is very important within the family. Yep. And after his father passed away, and we'll get into that in a minute, uh, there was the cat. And Ed flew the cat back to L.A. to mm -hmm. his house. And that was, tell the audience what was involved in that. Well, we are now all living happily ever after. Mm -hmm. I also have three dogs. Mm -hmm. and so, Well, three dogs and a cat now. And it was a little bit uh, challenging to begin with, 
two of the dogs uh, after the cat was in the house for about, oh, an hour. They were like, yeah. oh, okay, fine. Somebody knew. The third, it took a little bit longer for them to, uh, you know, reach a happy medium. Mm -hmm. But now they all get along. Well, you're taking a cat of 15 years old. Mm -hmm. You had to go to the vet, get a tranquilizer. Oh, yeah. For the trip. I'm very fortunate. This is a 15-year-old cat that still thinks he's a kitten. Yeah. Has a tremendous amount of energy mm -hmm. and uh, still gets into a lot of trouble and really keeps you on your toes. Well, then he had to go get a harness, yeah. right? No, there, there was a harness there. Oh, there was? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it, was a, it was a very interesting challenge because I had never traveled with a pet before yeah. in the air. Yeah. And when you are traveling with a pet, um, first of all, usually I fly with Southwest. Um, I would never put an animal into cargo. No. It would have to go in the no. plane with me. Uh, when you're going through security, the, uh, the TSA requires that you take the animal out of the pet carrier and hold them while they take the pet carrier and put it through the screening. And Ringo just did not like being in a pet carrier to begin with. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, it was a very mild tranquilizer, and had it not been for that, I couldn't have done it. Yeah. Because he would have just... <laughs> Well, it was all new to him. He's a house cat. Sure. He's never yeah. been out. Yeah. And taking him through all these people and all this commotion. Yeah. being I mean, Ed did put the pet carrier out for like a week, didn't you, so he could get used to it? Yeah, and it wound up where he would go into the pet carrier to sleep. Uh, but at the time, that was also after the house was cleaned out. Yeah. So there was really no place else for him. <laughs> Well, this, you know, this cat is now living happily in L.A. Mm -hmm. uh, now, let's talk about after your father died. Mm -hmm. The house had to be cleaned out. Everything had to be done. The process of that, and Ed did it within three months. Was it three months? Mm -hmm. Everything. So tell the audience where you started mm -hmm. and how quickly the house sold. I mean, that whole from A to B. I was very fortunate. After Dad passed, I just realized that I needed to do something to get the process going. I had no idea it was going to go as quickly as it did. Mm -hmm. um, about a couple of weeks, about maybe even one week after, mm -hmm. after Dad passed, uh, I started looking at the house, looking at what needed to be done. I realized I had to have an estate sale. So I did have to research and, and hire someone to help me with that. It's a very smart move. I was very fortunate. Um, the ladies that, that came in to help me, they knew exactly what they were doing. Um, when you are clearing out a house, it is amazing, amazing what comes out of the nook and crannies. Mm -hmm. But there were roughly, you know, how many years worth of collections there. And it was also for my mom, my dad, and my sister. So it was four lives. And there were a couple lives. of things for me, too. But Yeah, I mean, you're talking four lives yeah. doing that for. Yeah. Well, actually, there was some grandparent stuff, too. So. Okay. <laughs> so. But uh, they went ahead and helped me clear everything out. They also went ahead and staged everything for me for the estate sale. Mm -hmm. uh, turned the house into a, a, a complete unrecognizable space, um, but it needed to be done. Mm -hmm. It was a very, very difficult situation. Um, I helped them all I could with preparing for the estate sale. Mm -hmm. For the two days of the estate sale, I just stayed away. I had to. It uh, was too hard on you to watch? or I just didn't want to see it because yeah. I know what an estate sale usually does. I mean, you, you've got items that perhaps might be valuable, yeah. worth something, and you see it walk out the door for literally pennies on the dollar. Mm -hmm. I knew that was going to be happening, but I also knew it had to happen. So here we are. It was the um, end of May when Dad passed. Um, I had a couple of weeks to kind of figure out which end was up wound up hiring uh, the estate sale people. The estate sale was in mid-July. 
after the estate sale, then I had to work on getting the house cleaned up and prepared for market. So did you go to a real estate agent right away or did you wait till after the estate sale? This was before the estate sale. Okay. Again, it was very fortunate. The, uh, um, the realtor recommended a lady for the estate sale. Good. And um, she came over, checked things out, and she right up front said, you know, this is a little bit much for me. She, she was much more of a clean out yeah. rather than an estate sale. She said, but I have two ladies that I work with um, that are really, really good with this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, okay, well, great. And she said, let me give them a call. And she did. And they literally walked from next door oh over to God. me. Oh, my God. There were, well, I'll call them new neighbors. They had been there for probably 15 years. But because of me not living there, always just kind of visiting, I never met them. Mm -hmm. I never knew them. Mm -hmm. And I knew that they had a, uh, an antique store in the area, um, Rosebud Antiques in Countryside, Illinois. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, they were terrific. Yeah. Uh, but they came over, and so we finally got to meet. And I had interviewed other companies, and I, I lucked out. Yeah. So again, it was through the realtor, after the estate sale, um, I had to get the place painted. Mm -hmm. Realtor recommended a handyman that does painting. It wound up fair price, excellent job. So again, I lucked out. Yeah. Um, there were a couple of bumps in the road with some things, but for the most part, it just really worked out. Didn't you have to uh, take the carpeting up or something? Uh, we were fortunate in that there were hardwood floors underneath the carpeting. Okay, were they in pretty good shape? Or? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, they needed to be refinished, you know, but, yeah. but for the most part, they were in very good shape. So that, that, was, uh, that was quite a job, but it, but it was worth it. So. so by that time, I mean, you stayed in Chicago for that whole time. Well, that particular, I, I was there from roughly mid-April, um, until mid-August. Okay. I did take one trip back to L.A. But that was for like for a two day. days. Two days. Two days, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, it, well, it just took that much time. And when you are the only family member left, there is no one else that's going to do it for you. So I just stuck with it. Uh, again, with the house, the house went up on the market. It was on the market five days. Wow. You know, well, I, I worked with the realtor. We priced it very fairly. Mm -hmm. And um, just, you know, five days. What location in Chicago is the house? Well, it's in the southwestern suburbs. Okay. Called Countryside, okay. next door to LaGrange. I think people recognize LaGrange more. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. Um, so the neighborhood was a good location for people, or was it schools? Was it the people who bought it? Were well, they a younger couple? The, uh, <coughs> it was a, a couple with two children. Yeah. Uh, the house itself, the main issue against it, the main con issue, was that it was on a corner. Yeah. So it was next to a busy street. Yeah. So for a couple with young children, it was an issue. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, it was an excellent area okay. in terms of shopping, in terms of recreation. Um, it was just a very, very good area. See, I was trying to get the time, not timeline, but trying to get the location because for a house to sell in five days, you know, and all the work you put in beforehand, I mean, staging I th it really. But I think a lot of it just had to do with working with the realtor and, and working and getting a fair price. There are other homes in the area yeah. that went up on the market when, when my house did. Mm -hmm. They're still on the market. Yeah. So the realtor and I, we, the realtor did a good job. Yeah. So. And that was good because, I mean, I look for, well, we talked about this on the phone. I said, look for people who have a lot of sold signs, the realtors mm -hmm. who have that. And because you know they're proactive. You know they're going to move on your property. Or <clears throat> you look around to see a sign that you even recognize the company. Yeah. And that's really what happened. In the neighborhood, there were 
two homes that were being handled by Coldwell Banker. Yeah. And all of the other homes up for sale were being handled more with local um, companies. And I'm familiar with them, and, and I knew that they were nationwide and would mm -hmm. have more resources. Sure. And so that's why I went with them. But again, it was it was just it worked out great. I, I mean, the, yeah. the realtor was just, I mean, it's just so nice and even, just beautiful. So as a caregiver, there's a lot you have to think about from the time your parents <clears throat> or your loved one gets sick. All you have to do is realize that if you make the commitment to help them, yeah. you are giving up your life. Yeah, true. Uh, which is a very, very difficult thing. I, I was fortunate, if you will, to be in a situation where I could do that for them. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't an ideal situation, but it worked out. Yeah, I mean, it was hard for Ed to have a normal life in L.A. because he had to leave. Yeah. So to have any consistency in his own home for 14 years couldn't do it. <laughs> no. You couldn't do it because everything is, well, I have to leave on Tuesday or Thursday. You know, so for 14 years, there was no consistency in your own personal life. Mm -hmm. That does take a toll. Yeah. And like you said, once you make a commitment to a family, family member, friend, loved one, it's a commitment you make. I mean, here you have one person left to look out for, mm -hmm. in the end, your father. <clears throat> and, and, you know, don't get the wrong idea in thinking yeah. that, oh, I just love my family so much and yeah. all that. That wasn't it. Uh, they were my family. I did love them. Yeah. We had a difficult, challenging relationship for most of our lives. But when you see the people that are your family that you love when you see them in need mm -hmm. and know that there's not going to be anyone else to help them right you do what you got to do but i know a lot of people i mean i feel the same way as you feel but know a lot of people who just never would do that and that's their choice exactly that's their choice to do that if i am talking with someone that has that kind of an attitude, mm -hmm. I respect that decision. Because if you do the way I did it, yeah. you are giving up a lot. Yeah, you are. And yeah. you know, if, if you're a type of person that has an active good life or whatever, and just, then that's fine. Yeah, I mean, there are people. I did have an active good life, but. <laughs> he did have an active good life. He did, yes. But, you know, I really wanted to do this show with you because there are so many people here in Bitterford, well, everywhere, where, like you said, the roles reverse. Yeah. And you have to now take over your parents. The one thing that I learned very early on, take your emotions and leave them outside. Because when you're dealing with that kind of a situation, they're not the people that raised you. They're not the siblings that you grew up with. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are family that are in need. And they're not going to act the same way that you, they're not going to act the way you expect them to. No. And there's nothing like family to hit all the right buttons. Oh, I know. And you have to recognize that when they're hitting the buttons, it's because they're confused, you know, they're angry, they're, you know, whatever. I mean, and that's very true. I mean, there were many times Ed and I would get on the phone, and I mean, I could just hear it in his voice. You were worn down. Mm -hmm. And, but again, you can be worn down, and, but you have to come back and regroup. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, and it's true. You have to leave the emotions at the door yeah. to make logical decisions. One thing that probably helped me more than anything else, mm -hmm. uh, when my sister really started advancing with the Alzheimer's, uh, I happened to find a support group in Los Angeles oh, that I okay. would attend when the scheduling would work out that I could be there. Mm -hmm. So, 
And it was a support group for um, caregivers dealing with mainly seniors and with dementia, Alzheimer's. And I think that's what really saved my sanity because there were so many things happening. I didn't know what to do. Yeah. You go to a support group and you got somebody saying, you know, you know, my mother did this or my father did that. And, you know, then they'd tell me, you know, they would say what they did. And I'm going, oh, God, that's what happened. So it didn't happen to just me or my family. It's happening right. to everyone. And that's a good point. Yeah. So if you're in a caregiving situation, get help for yourself. Yeah. Do seek out a support group. Do seek out some kind of outlet, yeah. social environment, whatever. Yeah. Don't, don't allow yourself to get trapped inside it. Well, yeah, because a, a lot of people think they're the only ones going through that, and you become very isolated. <laughs> yeah, no. And there are so many people, and that's a good point, finding a support group. And I know there's a lot of them here that are free, um, where you can go in and maybe get ideas or uh -huh. know you're not alone, know this is a normal progression mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, of what is happening to your loved one. And again, keep your emotions outside. Yeah, that's very important. Yeah. You know, sometimes I look at the, um, you know, the nurses the, and other caregivers in, in the hospitals, the nursing homes, and, and I've looked at them and wondered, how do they do it? They're, su they're surrounded by, by this kind of a situation daily. Sure they and are. it's because they're able to detach themselves. They can still be a loving, caring human being mm -hmm. and not get involved emotionally. So, so that, that's what you have to do as well. I mean, with family stuff that I have had, and, and there was a point in the ICU unit watching the nurses, the monitors at their desk, mm -hmm. jumping up at the last minute. Yeah. Right there their burnout is very high, mm -hmm. a very high burnout, because emotionally and physically. But you're right, they have to cut it, but yet it does affect them. Oh, sure. And we're not saying, we're not saying to you that this is not going to affect you and that you're not going to cry. When Ed says leave the emotions at the door, is that for making decisions or to not show your parents or who you're taking care of? To not react the way you normally would to that kind of an, a situation. So that when they push those buttons, you can just go, okay, fine. And let it go mm -hmm. at that. Or is it also because, even though if it's news that is kind of scary, and you know it's scary for your parent, mm -hmm. you want to show no reaction thinking, oh, it's a minor thing. So you take the fear away from them? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that that's a good point because I think another way that you need, something else that you need to do to survive is you need to get realistic. You need to get real. When, you know, the medical personnel approach you with an issue or something, it's not a matter of, oh my gosh, oh no, no. what's going to happen? It's just a matter of, okay, this is the situation, where do we go from here? What needs to be done? And that's really hard to get to, to get to that point where you can do that. But if you look at the reality of the situation, what other choice do you have? You don't have another choice. No, you get all wrapped up emotionally, and it's like, okay, fine, tear your hair out, cry, whatever. Yeah. It doesn't accomplish anything. It no. doesn't help your family member. No, it really doesn't. I mean... One thing I keep thinking of when I say family member... Yeah. If at all possible... If you're in this kind of a situation, you take advantage of every, every family member, friend, whoever, to help you. Mm -hmm. And you're going to use it. You're going to need that help, and you're going to take advantage of it. And it might be a relative that just does something as simple as running out to the store once a week for you, but that yeah. will help you to take care of your family member Without someone to help you, it's much more difficult. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, also, when you would go to Chicago and you would get ready to leave, Ed 
would call me from, from some store because there, there's a checklist of things that he had to purchase before he left so the caregivers had them. So it wasn't like, okay, I'm going by, there's a checklist. Yeah. You know, so there's so many things to think of, but Ed's right. Take advantage of family members or if friends want to cook up food that is easy to prepare, mm -hmm. let them do it. Yeah. Just let them do it uh, because it's all-encompassing. It yeah. really is. If somebody is willing to help you in any way, shape, or form, grab it. Take advantage of it. You don't to. abuse it. You just take advantage of it. Accept it willingly. Yeah. I know a lot of family members, they have this pride thing and all that. No, get over it. Yeah. You know, if you need help, you need help. I, I found that to be one of the biggest problems. Not, not so much with my family because we kind of got over it. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of other families that I'm familiar with, they could never, ever get over it. They still have the pride or whatever. After a while, that is not helpful. Well, and uh, no. <laughs> no, it's not. I mean, you know, I mean, there are some families who are not close and their friends are like family. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and they offer and help take it, like you said. In addition, with checking your emotions at the door, mm -hmm. uh, not so much just the emotions, but the physicality of the situation. As an example, I had to help my sister take a shower. Yeah. And that was a very, very, very difficult thing for me to do. Yeah. You know, I was brought up in a very conservative household. Mm -hmm. And anything like that where there might be any kind of interaction yeah. it was just very very difficult sure but it had to be done I'm and glad then, you brought that up because I did think about that on the days when the caregivers were not there I had to do it yeah and it's it's a little bit strange but having to do those things helped me yeah I wound up learning so much about my sister that I did not know yeah uh, growing up I think we were, like many families, yeah. couldn't stand each other, mm -hmm. yeah, constant. But that's the way it was. But with her illness, I really had to get to know her. I was really lucky about seven months before she passed. Um, she was lucky. She was, she was in fairly good condition up until uh, about three months before she passed. So I did bring her out to L.A. with the caregiver. And um, this one afternoon, the caregiver had never seen Rodeo Drive. Mm -hmm. So dropped the caregiver off at Rodeo Drive and took my sister, and we went up to the top of the hills there to Mulholland Drive. Mm -hmm. And there's this one area where there's a nice park bench and you could just sit there. Yeah. And so we got out and sat there and talked for maybe a half an hour before the wind drove us nuts and it was cold out. Uh, but she was having a good day. Okay. She was very, very lucid mm -hmm. and had an absolutely amazing conversation with her. So it's things like that. It's that's, that one moment in time yeah. you caught. Yeah. And that's what makes it all worth it. So. Well, we're getting close to the end of the show, but I mean, I, I think people who are watching this show, I think they really, really will enjoy it because a lot of them are going through this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, checking your emotions at the door. Um, some, I mean, I know a lot of emotional people. Yeah, well, <laughs> well we all do. <clears throat> but it's very important. I'm living proof that you can survive the situation. I mean, think about this, everyone. You've got 14 years of back and forth from L.A. to Chicago from a mother to a sister to a father, having to watch and cross the T's and dot the I's for that long with your sibling and your parents, and changing your way of interacting with them, being a caregiver to them. Your thinking has to change. Yeah, you gotta be the adult. That's rough. I know. <laughs> I hate being the adult. Um, but you also, um, 
I think you really also have to kind of, you know, you know you love them or whatever issues you have or maybe there isn't a great love or there is a great love, you're the only one left. They are human beings. They need help. And I know with Ed. Um, well, I, I know I was there through all this, that he gave 150% of himself and his life because he couldn't live with himself any other way unless he did that. Hmm. I mean, you really couldn't. Yeah. You couldn't. So on that note, I want to thank you for being on the show. Thank you. And letting our viewing audience know and educate them from your point of view, what you went through. Hopefully you picked up a lot of tips here. Um, and find a support group so you know you're not alone. Yeah, definitely. And in L.A., are they free? I mean... Most support groups, they, they, I mean, there's no cost. Okay. They're, they're groups of people. That, you know, there are a number of um, church organizations yeah. that will sponsor, a number of, of different communities sponsor. Uh, if you're dealing with this, alzheimers.org. Okay. It, it's an amazing reference. All right. So hopefully this all helped and you found the show where you can kind of let yourself know you're doing the right thing. Or if you feel you're not doing the right thing, this might give you a few little guidelines. So in the meantime, you'll come back to the show when you come back to Maine again. I sure hope so. Okay, you will. And I want to thank our viewing audience um, for taking the time, watching Tony Time. And we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.